as there is a need for governments across the world and especially in Africa to increase government spending in order to stimulate a fast and sustained recovery. So in Africa, uh, growth is projected to uh, slow down to 3.8% in 2022 from projected 4.1% uh, at the beginning of 2022. And uh, as we all know, uh, Africa is confronted with weaker external demand and elevated energy and food prices in Africa. Uh, in addition to rapidly increasing borrowing cost uh, and adverse weather events. The World Economic Situation and Prospect 2023 report underscores the need for supportive and accommodative fiscal measures to lift growth and accelerate progress towards uh, the SDGs. Among other things, the report emphasizes the need for governments to take a strategic approach in redirecting public expenditure towards sectors with high fiscal multipliers and better targeting vulnerable groups. In addition to supporting short-term aggregate demand, public investment can stimulate capital formation and expand productive capacities and lift potential growth. And also, eventually, of course, as growth improves, this can help countries to uh, address the or confront the debt sustainability problem. So let me take this opportunity to thank all of you for coming uh, to this uh, launch. And uh, uh, I believe your contribution to the discussion today uh, will be very uh, helpful to readers as you write tomorrow about your about the launch of this uh, report and about what we are saying uh, about growth and development, uh, social and economic development globally and in Africa in particular. So my colleague uh, Lee Everts, Evert, uh, the chief of uh, the macroeconomic analysis section of the macroeconomics and governance division of ECA will make a short presentation on WESP 2023. Uh, the, the presentation will highlight uh, developments in the global economy and then focus on developments, uh, economic and social developments in Africa. Uh, thank you and uh, over to you, Lee. Thank you, Adam. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, online and yeah, in, in the conference room. Uh, let me just thank you for coming here this morning to our gathering um, and to everyone, just thank everyone that made it possible, that did all the arrangements. So the WESP is, this this publication of WESP is, is, is quite of particular interest as the world continues to confront multiple and interconnected shocks. So in this, I, I think Adam has given a broad overview, but I would just like to expand a little bit on what he said. So in the midst of sluggish recovery from the effects of COVID, uh, the globe is facing food and energy crisis aggravated by the Russo-Ukraine um, war, as well as a cost of living crisis that is caused by record high inflation. And we already know that before all these things happened, um, all these interconnected shocks happened, poverty and inequality was already high. So what what is happening is that these consistent and interconnected shocks are, are deepening and widening poverty uh, and inequality. And it threatens to reverse two decades of progress made in countering them, which is really problematic. So if we just consider the 20% uh, of, of, of people above the poverty line, we have 144, which is 10 percent, million, non, 144 million, which is 10 percent, non-poor that were at high risk of falling into poverty in 2022 alone. And that's a massive number. 10 percent of the whole of Africa. It is, it's really 
something that needs focus and action. And this happens as we know that poverty in Africa is, is dynamic and tra transient. So it means that poorer households can fall, move in and out of poverty much quicker when there's these exogenous shocks happening. So further to these shocks, they have also increased food insecurity on the continent due to these elevated prices. <clears throat> and I mean, we will go into some detail about what what is happening now and what we're seeing going forward. And with these inflationary issues, um, tightening global financial conditions, uh, which lead, lead to currency depreciation, depreciation and capital flight, the expense of imports and debt services putting pressure on developing nations. Well, as Adam said, climate issues also just wreaking havoc uh, in, in, in Africa. So prudent government spending will continue, um, but there will still be monetary tightening, muted consumption, and... No, no, I'm just talking. <laughs> I'll continue. So it's really a no-brainer that um, action is needed from, from global and national actors. Um, otherwise, recovery is going to take years. We are going to take years to get back from here. So in light of this, the West paints a bleak picture, I think more uncertain than bleak, um, of the near term. So the presentation is divided into two parts. The first part will look at the global overview and the second part would look at Africa. And I think this is where everyone wants to go. <clears throat> so it's been a challenging year for the global economy. World output growth is last year. It was a, a, a challenging year. It was okay, but we had challenges. This year is gonna be even more tough. Um, so world output is projected to decelerate from 3% in 2022 to 1.9% in 2023, uh, marking one of the lowest growth rates in, in recent decades. So the slowdown will cut across developed and developing countries with many, many facing risk of mild recessions. We've been reading in the newspapers, this is where we're heading and based on our analysis, it does seem possible um, of, of mild recession. And if your developed countries <clears throat> If this starts in developed countries, the knock-on effect on Africa may be significant. And this comes just barely as we've recovered from the shock of the pandemic. So the outlook remains quite uncertain. So what went wrong in 2023? It's very interesting. If you look at the previous slide, you will see the May projections and across the board um, from most of the institutions. The May projections were quite sort of optimistic-ish, 3.1, um, 3.1, 3.4%. .1, now you revise, given everything that's happening, and you see that in 2023, the expectation is global growth 1.9%, and 2024, 2.7%. So what went wrong? <clears throat> There's a lot of things. Um, so when inflation started to pick up um, during the pandemic, central banks believed it was transitory. But actually now it turned out to be more um, persistent and caused by su um, supply and demand in imbalances. Um, there was a quote by Jerome um, Powell, the chairman of, of the Fed. He said, we tend to use transitory to mean that it won't leave a permanent mark in the form of inflation I think it's probably good to retire uh, the word, and it is. Given what's happening now, it is. Another key factor that shaped the weak economic performance in 2022 was the outbreak of the uh, Russian-Ukraine war, which disrupted everything. Food, energy markets, pushed up prices, and just shoving inflation into overdrive. Uh, global inflation in 22 averaged around 9%, which was the highest rate in several decades. Um, this, I mean, this is a very interesting conversation in that the world is experiencing this. Africa's inflation is higher, but Africa's inflation has been quite high over the last decade. Uh, Africa has been fighting inflation. So it was, it was quite interesting to see how this plays out. And to tame inflation, central banks across developing and developed countries raised rates uh, aggressively 
to weaken, to weaken demand. So these interest rates and rapid tightening financial conditions has increased debt vulnerability in many developing countries and specifically in Africa. And these rising interest rates are also making it difficult for, for many developing countries just to roll over and restructure that, that debt that they have. <clears throat> for 2023, there is some diverging trend, uh, trends in growth. I mean, we've seen this divergence even last year, but I think it's going to be mo more pronounced this year. Um, with Africa not coming out too bad, but with some downside uh, uh, risk and uncertainty to it, and we'll discuss that a little bit later. So let's just go into um, some of the uh, more developed economies. In the U.S., GDP is projected to expand by only 0.4% after growing almost 2% in 2022. So consumers are expected to cut back on 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 um, to cut back on spending on the back of higher interest rates, lower real incomes. Uh, um, Adam was talking about wages and significant declines in in house household network. In Europe, in, in Europe, many countries are projected to experience a mild recession, uh, with elevated energy costs, high inflation, and tighter financial conditions um, depressing household consumption and investment. So the EU is forecast to grow by 0.2% in 2023. That's very low, down from 3.3% in 2022. That's real cause for concern. In Africa, we know the, EU, uh, the EU is one of Africa's main trading partners. And the waning of monetary and fiscal support are weighing on the near-term prospects of Africa. So it, it, it might just uh, be very tough uh, as the year unfolds. Japan, uh, despite growing uh, at a moderate pace in um, of 1.5 percent, is expected to be an, among the best performers due to the <coughs> expansionary fiscal and monetary policy. Um, China will be uh, uh, China's GDP figures came out just earlier this year, hitting the estimation, the prelim estimation, hitting about 3% for 2022, but it's expected to grow to 4.8%. And I mean, this this could bode well and bad for, for the world economy in that with China coming back online, you know, there could be, there would obviously be a higher demand for goods, um, some luxury goods. Um, there might be more commodities sought that um, from from the developed nations now that that they open again to inc increase production but on the other hand with china coming in it means that there is more demand for similar goods that we have already been struggling for that has high cost and that might just push push prices up but this is I mean, it, it only just started, so we'll see how the year unfolds. So there can be a, a positive and a negative impact to this. <clears throat> um, is the worst behind us? <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, um, so very briefly, for two, uh, very briefly, um, for 2024, a moderate improvement is expected with some macroeconomic headwinds, of course, uh, the pace and depth of monetary policy, um, these are some of the uncertainties, the duration intensity of the Ukraine war, and uh, the level of supply chain pressures. So what needs to be added is there have been some signs of inflation, uh, um, that inflation have peaked and it's going to soften in, in, in 2023. And it looks like we'll be back to pre-inflation levels by 2024. Hopefully, if nothing else happens again in this year. Um, it is quite interesting in terms of, of inflation that now that it has peaked, there is the expectation that central banks will slow or pause monetary tightening. So <clears throat> if you've read the World Economic Forum Chief Economist Update, it's very interesting in that they survey um, economists, public, public and private uh, economists from, from all over the world, and they have indicated in this survey that most most economies had said, you know, it, there's going to be a sort of monetary policy, the monetary policy stances are going to be maintained, um, except the ones in in the US and, and in Europe. So already you can see that 
type of pressure coming up, but the degree to the tightening might be uh, a bit less, which is not, you know, all that bad. So there's also a small glimmer of hope that exists that monetary policy in the US and Europe will, by the end of 2023, loosen a little bit by the last quarter. Uh, lastly, supply side pressure, sorry, has eased but still remain above, above pre-pandemic levels. And I think this is where why everyone is here. The interesting part, what is going to happen in Africa for this year. Africa doesn't look that bad, so it's good. Um, if you look at the WISP report, and it has been out, I think it's the third, it would be the third best region um, of, of 2023, which is not bad in itself, but of course with a lot of uncertainty uh, around it. So economic growth in Africa is forecast to increase to 2020, in 2023, while economic activity remains below pre-pandemic levels. And Africa, as we know, Africa has been hit by uh, many shocks, compromising external um, demand and a sharp uptick global inflation, higher borrowing costs and adverse weather events. And this is compounded by some of our internal shocks that we also have in Africa already. Um, so you know, it, it, it becomes quite complex. Uh, it, normally, it becomes quite complex in Africa. Price levels have risen significantly, and I know we've all felt that, driven by supply chain disruptions and the fallout from the war in Ukraine. Um, that has resulted in um, banks tightening their monetary stances. Governments has fought to preserve the livelihood throughout the pandemic. Fiscal positions uh, in Africa has worsened. So as they have done this, the fiscal positions have worsened and all this shocks has not helped it. And the average debt level has risen to more than 60% of GDP. And this level is expected to be maintained in 2023 even though there are some tax revenues, recovery and tax revenues coming in. Um, now, this is, I guess, the one that everyone wants to see. It's the growth forecast for, for 2023. So economic growth in Africa is expected to increase from 4% from in 2023 from 3.7% in 2022. Um, you will note the graph on the left. Africa excludes Libya, and you can see the difference when Libya is excluded from there. When Libya is excluded, there's a, a decrease. But when on the whole Africa, uh, there is a, a, a definite positive trajectory going on <clears throat> with some downside risk. So as for the sub-regional trends, growth is forecast to edge up in West Africa, stabilize in Central Africa and East Africa and accelerate, accelerate in North Africa and decelerate in, in Southern Africa. So in 2023, as you can see from the slide, the gro growth forecast um, for North Africa is 4.1% from, <clears throat> um, from pre-levels pre that were higher, 5.1% uh, in East Africa, that was 3.4% I think the previous year, um, 3.4% in Central Africa which was 3. Point, oh, which is flat, um, 3.8% in West Africa, 2.3% in Southern Africa. So maybe just going to a little bit of detail on a little bit of detail on what is happening in the regions. Growth in North Africa is expected to decelerate when you exclude Libya. Remember, um, Libya has now become uh, growth in Libya has now started to to boom again with strong oil prices and their hydrocarbon deals which is which is a great move forward for them but uh, one of the main influences for the rest of the region maybe to contract a little bit is a result of um, exports from um, the North African countries because of this expectation of a recession in, in the Eurozone. Um, and what this means is um, demand for exports from Northern Africa will decrease, tourist arrivals will decrease, and obviously um, remittance inflows as well. There will be an impact on them in 2023. So 
countries like Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia would feel the impact of this the most <clears throat> as they con conduct more trade, trade with the Eurozone. In Southern Africa, the biggest culprit is um, that slowing down the, the uh, uh, economies there is, is South Africa with expected growth of only 1.5% compared to 2% the previous year. As you know, over the past year, the country has been dealing with a lot of internal issues. So except that there's external shocks, and this was the example that I was making previously, we have external and internal issues that's happening in Africa. And South Africa is a clear example of this. Um, <clears throat> There's electricity constraints, there's been uh, infrastructure constraints leading to, you know, restrictions on the, the volume of, ex especially exports of main commodities like coal, iron ore, etc. through the ports and, and through rail. High unemployment that's been sticky for a very long time and we are still not back to 2019 levels. Um, high inflation and obviously tighter monetary policy. And... The same thing as with um, the North Africa zone. If there's a recession and in the Eurozone and the US, there will be a drop in South Africa real real exports this year, make it this, making it the slowest growing of the major eco African economies in, in 2023. <clears throat> Growth in East Africa will continue to be re, uh, driven by the rebound of services and industrial activity, higher state spending, increased trade, the tourism sector, um, recovery, closer regional linkages under the East Africa community, and in, in, increased infrastructure investments, particularly in Rwanda, Rwanda and Uganda. Growth in Central Africa will be driven by Cameroon and Gabon due to um, strengthened oil prices coupled with strong domestic production in both countries. For West Africa, Nigeria's recovery is actually seen as a level shifter, let me put it that way. So the recovery in 2023 could help raise Africa's growth to more than 4% in the medium term. At this point, it's just over about 3%, just under 4%. So. <clears throat> That means that, that there's great potential. In West Africa, Senegal is also expected to continue its remarkable growth improvement in 2023 due to the commencement of hydrocarbon exports, which are coinciding with um, you know, the elevated national <clears throat> gas prices. But obviously, there are risks and challenges to this. Uh, escalation of the war in the Ukraine and extended disruption to grain export from Russia and the Ukraine may cause additional inflationary pressures on, on food and energy. Persistently high global inflation <coughs> due to pr the, the protracted war. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> And some uncertainty that we're seeing around the Black Grain um, Initiative may cause additional um, volatility in global food prices, which is a, li which is a little bit unsettling. Um, <clears throat> and as I said, the Chinese recovery, although it may be good, there may be some added inflationary pressures um, coming from there. And um, but overall, um, the hope is that it will add some supply, uh, it will aid in some supply chain bottleneck. So there's a little trade off, a play off happening there, and it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. <clears throat> so this global, uh, persistently high global inflation may force tight monetary stances, tighter monetary stances in, in some countries, and result in deceleration of global growth which will stagnate um, demand in Africa. <clears throat> so again, just as public debt has risen to more than 60%, which I discussed earlier, it's expected to stay at this level. <clears throat> such, such a scale was actually last witnessed in 2000 before the highly indebted poor country initiative was launched. So, I mean, it's it's time for something different to happen now. Congo, Tunisia, Zambia, and Zimbabwe have higher levels of debt in Africa with debt repayments eating up the portion of the government, a big chunk of the government revenue. 
and given this higher given this higher interest rates because of everything that is happening uh, weak exchange rate and capital out in uh, outflows <clears throat> a number of african countries will face severe challenges in in servicing and rolling their debt um, external debt um, lastly <clears throat> i mean the presentation is done uh, <laughs> i just wanted to sort of reiterate that you know this this our, the the issue with our challenges with um <clears throat> The cost of, of, of food, of importing food, has just put uh, a greater emphasis on, on African countries trying to, to develop um, our agricultural uh, 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 markets more and <clears throat> to do, you know, once those are developed, really start working on integrating trade in Africa. Um, and that's the only way we can do it. We need to support each other yeah, and to start doing that. I think we can do. We, we can do it. Thank you. Once again, thanks, Lee. Uh, as you can see, uh, Africa, uh, in terms of growth, Africa is doing far better than global average. Uh, but uh, growth in Africa of about 4.1% in 2022 and expected 3.8% in 2023 remains far below uh, uh, Africa's potential and far below what Africa needs to do in order to address its uh, uh, socio-economic uh, challenges. Uh, so Africa is facing more challenges than the rest of the world uh, in terms of uh, uh, infrastructure, in terms of public service, in terms of health, education, in terms of energy, and so on. So uh, really what we need to do uh, in the continent is to uh, work hard to address the challenges and uh, uh, raise growth rates uh, to pre-pandemic uh, levels and beyond. Uh, those pre-pandemic levels were not enough, but still uh, we are below the pre-pandemic levels. So I'd like to open the floor for questions, comments. Uh, uh, please, uh, if you want to ask a question, give us your name and your affiliation. <laughs> I am Kasahong from the Ethiopian Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, my question is, as climate crisis continues, as food and energy crisis continues, and African nations' inflation record is high, what is your recommendation to the African Union to <clears throat> confront it, this situation? Uh, because the extraordinary uh, executives and um, heads of states meeting is to be held uh, very recently. So what is your recommendation so as to uh, find a solution in the shortest time possible? Thank you very much. This is a billion dollar question, uh, you know. Uh, I think the problem, these problems have been with us for a long time. The climate change, food crisis, energy crisis, uh, all these issues you have uh, mentioned have been with us for a long time. Unfortunately, there is no uh, uh, prescription for immediate you know, solution. Uh, in the, e in the uh, ECA, uh, we have always uh, emphasized the need for African economies to transform their economies, African countries to transform their economies. So transformation is not, is not cannot be done, of course, uh, immediately, uh, but it is a must. Uh, I think if we are serious about it and if we start a process of transformation and diversification five, ten years down the line, we will see that uh, Africa is uh, improving uh, its uh, economies, 
performance and addressing its uh, socio-economic challenges. What we mean by diversification and transformation is really for Africa to start to add value to what uh, we produce inside Africa. All the raw materials we produce, agricultural, mineral, and so on, uh, should not be exported in raw form. By adding value, we increase uh, uh, income and uh, we increase uh, export earnings and uh, that will help us eventually uh, to grow faster and also to sustain growth in the face of crisis and global shocks. Uh, so we still, we will still emphasize this, uh, that the African countries need to add value, to diversify their economies, to expand at, uh, regional trade, which is very critical uh, for us really to uh, protect ourselves from external shocks, shocks that are external to the continent. Uh, in the short term, of course, uh, we emphasize uh, sound macroeconomic management. Uh, countries need to uh, make sure that they are uh, uh, adopting, the, the, adopting the right uh, policies in order to maintain macroeconomic stability. Uh, we need, of course, to stabilize our economies uh, by lowering inflation. So monetary tightening uh, is important in many situations and also uh, fiscal policies uh, have to be uh, consolidated, you know, has have to be uh, accommodating, you know, to the needs of African economies in terms of increasing expenditure in this targeted spending that can support growth, that can help reduce uh, cost of living. But at the same time, uh, we don't want uh, to overspend and fuel inflation. So there are very uh, delicate balances to be made uh, when we are uh, designing and implementing uh, fiscal and monetary policies in the continent. So we have seen most of the economies uh, are, are really doing well in terms of macroeconomic management, but we have seen some examples. I'm not going to mention any country. Uh, we have examples of countries that are running very high inflation experiencing high inflation rate and they are running very high, you know, uh, budget deficits uh, financed by printing money. And this has fueled inflation and exchange rate deterioration and also created uh, uh, debt crisis. Uh, uh, I'm sure you, are, you, you, you can name uh, some of these countries, but I'm not going to name them. Thank you. Adam has summarized what I wanted to say about the balance um, between fiscal and monetary policy that is really required now. Um, but, I mean, that is required to sort of protect your most vulnerable households. And uh, one of the things that ECA has always been a great advocate of is of strengthening in the short term um, safety security nets and temporary targeted cash transfers just to protect those vulnerable populations. It is something that can be done quickly um, just to help alleviate some of that um, inflationary pressures. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, we are most likely facing a situation of stagflation and the in known history we had this um, during the great depression the only difference is that i think the situation even is even more complicated now uh, because of the global interconnected um, uh, world now we are living so how much have we learned from the past experience um, and you have rightly pointed out about the importance of structural transformation i just wanted to um, add to your voice like even the good examples of the countries that we are seeing, like Libya, uh, like some other countries from all the five regions, all of them have good signs of positive growth, but those growths are mostly fueled by commodity-dependent um, export earnings. So we really need to um, diversify. We really need to ensure the inclusive growth, uh, this commodity-dependent growth within this perspective of stagflation and 
potential risk of Dutch disease, it might end up in a situation where the poor will be even more excluded. So I just wanted to share that um, you know, uh, insight with you. Thank you. There is a question online. We, I mean, Africa, or I mean, we seem to be more reactive to to shocks than proactive. So, based on the lesson actually that we've learned through this sort of mindful, do we have do we have any sort of plan to rather go ahead and work with member states to? increase their preparedness and um, their ways of actually projecting the crisis and getting ready in terms of macro and fiscal policy. Because, I mean, we, we're projecting some sort of deceleration of growth based on a number of factors. Beyond that, how do we work with member states to ensure that, I mean, they are ready and, and, they, and they, are, they have plans in place to, to actually contain the impact, the potential impact of, of the four sort of the projected further crisis. Thank you. We are working on a report, economic report on Africa 2023 uh, on uh, uh, impact of global shocks uh, on Africa and Africa's preparedness to global shocks. Uh, the basic uh, uh, conceptualization we have is that uh, global shocks are a new normal and countries have to be uh, prepared all the time to respond to this new normal and particularly we analyze the impact of recent shocks climate shocks ukraine pandemic and the 20 uh, covid 19 pandemic and uh, i think i would like to really uh, just uh, give you head ups on uh, this important uh, report, uh, which will be launched uh, around uh, June this year. Uh, but I think we will start the discussion on this during Conference of Ministers next month. Uh, Africa uh, uh, has uh, a lot of vulnerabilities. Uh, we mentioned uh, these global shocks, but has a lot of internal uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, structure of economies, like I said, dominated by primary commodity production and high dependence on rain-fed agriculture, and uh, which is, of course, subject to climate uh, and weather uh, changes. And unfortunately, also, uh, every time we hope that conflicts and uh, political instability uh, decline, uh, then uh, we, are, we, are, we, are, we see f uh, conflicts flaring here and there uh, in, in many parts of Africa. Uh, and uh, conflicts have been a source of instability and also a threat to uh, growth and performance, economic performance uh, in the continent. And uh, this year, 2023, we are going to have 13 elections in Africa. Uh, so uh, this also uh, this is also one of the threats uh, to uh, stability and economic performance in 2023. But uh, I think uh, we uh, in this report uh, we are going to advocate for new uh, strategies, country at country level and at continental level uh, for responding to uh, global crises and as well as uh, internal uh, crises. Uh, I'm very happy that we have a physical uh, launch today. Uh, we used to have, as some of you might remember, we used to have uh, physical launches in here, uh, well attended launches of uh, reports uh, including the economic report on Africa. Uh, but because of the, the pandemic and many people, many staff working from home or from outside of uh, duty station, uh, we did not have uh, this interaction for a uh, number of years. Uh, once again, I would like to thank you very much and look forward to seeing you again uh, here in ECA. Thank you.